kind of uh, moments and uh, maybe how it would might translate to our dealing with these moments in a better way of the course. I'd be really obliged. All our speakers have a time duration of eight minutes talk. So that does leave us with some time with, uh, for question and answer. Please unhesitantly ask all those uh, small gray areas which are there in, in refractive surgery in your respective practices. And I really look forward to being as helpful and as communicative and ensure my colleagues would give you tons of information on this. So we start off with our first speaker who is a, a very esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Carl Zitzen, who, who is going to be uh, giving the keynote address. So I do hope uh, Dr. Carl ha looks, has a great uh, four-day period with us. So on to you, Doctor. Thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to speak about Presbylasic, what can we do? And how can I get the first, the first slide here? Thank you. No, it's okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Please ensure that the timer uh, is fixed for eight minutes for all of our speakers. And and where it's going on here? Okay. Thank you. The history of corneal presbyopia correction. The PIK and LASIK approaches are the sectoral ablation, concentric central near zone, inferior off-center ablation, and concentric peripheral near zone. Here you can see that uh, more than 20 years, nearly 30 years, we are trying to do presbyopic surgery on the cornea. The approaches for near vision enhancement is a bifocal and multifocal ablation. It was f central near with peripheral distance from Louis Lewis and Bruce Jackson with the Visix uh, machine Presbyopic LASIK in 2001 and from Franco Bartoli with the wavefront guided PRK, sometimes denoted as Presby LASIK, done with the cult size Meditech MEL60. The disadvantages of the bifocal cornea, you have to model the cornea for the, or that was the idea to model the cornea for presbyopia. You have two pictures at the retina, one for far, one for near. One picture is sharp, the other is blurry, or both are blurry. Loss of contrast, light scattering from transition zone, and you have a long-lasting epithelial healing response. Today approaches for breast biopia correction is a multifocal IOL, the EDOF, the accommodative IOL, scleral implants, small diameter corneal inlay like camera or breast B lens, monovision multifocal PRK LASIK as breast B max, central steep area with a supracore, femtosecond second intracore procedure, and the atheric PRK LASIK like laser blended vision. Uh, the overview about monovision LASIK is mon monofocal treatment for one eye, dominant eye for far vision, non-dominant eye for near vision, the best current option at the, mo at the moment, and it is an atheric ablation. But for more than 1.5 diopter difference, you can have binocular problems. Here you have the super core, the Bausch and Lomb Technola central sleep area for near vision for patients more than 40 years of age, near addition from plus one till plus 2.5 diopters, bilateral procedure, prolonged healing time up till three months, non atheric ablation, pupil dependent centration critical. 
Here you see a um, uh, European multi-center study, and you can see that it's for the near vision, it seems to be quite good, but for the far vision, that lasts a longer time. The binocular uncorrected distance visual acuity on the left and binocular uncorrected near visual acuity on the right. Overview intracore, the Bausch and Lomb Technolas with the femtosecond laser, um, mainly done from Louis Ruiz in Bogota, five second, five ring intrastromal incisions to introduce biomechanical changes, monocular correction of hyperopic eyes, central corneal sleeping, a risk of keratoconus, not recommended in my country, clinical data preliminary. The Presbymax from the Schwind Eye Tech Sol Solutions is a multifocal LASIK approach, bilateral multifocal ablation. It's a, like a Presbymax hybrid. It is coming with an atmospheric ablation, a one eye for an ear, one eye for far looking. Multifocal focality tries to reach binocular vision for far and near, and uh, they have some difficulties at night driving. The laser blended vision is pa for patients from 40 till 60. Bilateral simultaneous treatment, increase in depth of field, enhance aptitudes to monovision. Retreatments are possible, hyperopics with and without astigmatism, and myopics are possible. Treatment range from plus 4 till minus 6. Advantages increase depth of field to enlarge the visual acuity in near and intermediate. Increased spherical aberration without subjective side effects. Disadvantages, halo, clear, reduced visual acuity, positive dysphotopsia, no reversibility, enhancement possible but difficult and limited to 1.5 diopter and isometropy. We have two groups, one myopic group, one hyperopic group, you see the myopic from minus 3.40 pre spherical equivalent and uh, six months later minus 0.17 for the dominant and minus 0.90 for the non-dominant eye. And in the hyperopic group, in the, the pre spherical equivalent plus 1.68 plus minus 0.2, after half a year minus 0.02 for the dominant eye or for the non-dominant eye minus 0.94. Here you see the age distribution mainly between 40 and 60. Stability in the myopic group near no um, it's nearly stable after one year and in the hyperopic group you have a it seems to have a regression Predictability in the myopic group after six months, quite stable, and after six in the hyperopic group, you get under corrections more than uh, plus three till plus four diopters. The change in cor corrected distance visual acuity you can see here for the myopic group in 72% and we gained lines then in the hyperopic group. And the monocular near visual acuity after six months, cumulative for the myopic and hyperopic hook for JGA2 or better in both groups, the same. The binocular near with, in comparison with the binocular distance, uncorrected visual acuity after uh, six months in the myopic group, we have JGA1 and the visual acuity of 2020 in 61% for the myopic group, and in the hyperopic group, it seems to be better as 74%. Complications is the incorrect flap, decentration, monocular diplopy, dry eye, regression, especially in hyperopic eyes. In summary, with the breast biopic, with the breast bilasic, all breast bilasic approaches are far from being perfect. In comparison, laser blended vision seems to be at the moment, the procedure with the least amount of side effects, contrast sensitivity in laser blended vision is not reduced because of an aspheric ablation profile. Intracorneal procedures probably could have better results. Thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you, doctor, uh, for throwing light on an area where uh, we are still in our initial days of doing press BOP classic. Of course, we have an audience, uh, one of our um, faculty here who's done it, and I'm sure you would have tons to tell about it. So essentially, we all know this session is on controversy and refractive surgery, so you get to know a lot more interesting things, and we have uh, a great uh, speaker here, Dr. Kumar, doctor, who's the uh, king of uh, Mumbai, who's going to first talk on why touch the cornea, faking IOL is always the answer. So let's hear him out. Good morning to you all, and thank you, Chitra. I'm going to talk on about uh, when ICL can be advised or can be done. So this controversy is always going to be there. So when can we do LASIK, surface, or a retinal pathology? So if a patient has LASIK, uh, lattices in the retina, you can, of course, laser them and then go ahead and do a uh, application. If the patient does not want that, then you can do a surface if you have a fear that the pressure on the eye is going to increase. So when can you think of flaps or ICL in today's option? So when to create a flap? when to create surface, when to do LASIK, when to do ICL is what I'm going to show. So in a pre-op analysis, we all know that there is a refractive error and the relation is to pachymetry. So we have to know the photopic pupil and we do this and accordingly we calculate the optical zone is analyzed from the wavefront analyzer. And from the op scan, we can get uh, or a pentacam or a G6, whatever method that you have, uh, you have to rule out keratoconus and we have to get the anterior chamber depth from the op scan. So when LASIK is not possible, for example, a refractive error of 10 with a 2, uh, astigmatism at 180 and a pachy of 480, obviously we know that LASIK is not possible and the pupil is 6.3. So then, and if the anterior chamber depth is 2.82, we know that the cutoff is 2.80, then this patient can be advised at toric ICL. If other possibility is a 10 with 2, 180 and a pachy of 510 and a pupil of 630, now, many people do not do surface treatment for more than minus 8. Um, even I don't do that. Of course, then this patient is, has a good anterior chamber depth, can go ahead and do uh, ICL, which is a toric ICL. But of course, if you think of doing LASIK, we want a residual bed. Now, I keep a residual bed of 300. Now, just to show you a surface treatment, what I have is something called as epilasic. Here, the epithelium is also removed by the laser itself. So there's no scraping, there's no alcohol, there is nothing. This behaves much better. Now we have something new called as the smart pulse technology. The ablation is much more closer. The healing is much more faster. Normally in epilase, it takes about three to four days to properly get epithelized and the patient gets better vision. But in this case, uh, it's even faster. In about one and a half to two days, the epithelium has healed. Of course, the surface is a little raw. But as you can see, there was nothing really applied here. You just make the surface dry. and the whole treatment is done by the laser itself. So the ablation of the epithelium, you will get a very well punched out margin and this works quite well. Now let's look at the relationship between pachymetry and we know that there is a percentile that has to be calculated. So if the refractive error is 5 with 2 at 90 and a pachy of 470 and a pupil of 660 and the pentacam is normal and no family history of keratoconus, then you can think of whatever other options that are there. But the most important is this, the flap thickness plus ablation depth divided by central corneal thickness. So the percentile calculation is important, but recently there was a paper presented where they crossed the percentile and 20% of the patients were beyond the percentile and yet nobody developed keratoconus. So this formula that we have been following for so long may also be questioned in the near future. But this is what we are following now at this level. So uh, coming to ICL, what are the complications? As you all know that there is cataract and glaucoma, but this all has to do with sizing. So sizing is 99%. If you have the right sizing, your job is done well and quite easy. So I'll just show you some example. The sizing can be done by an op scan, UBM, Pentacam, IOL Master or Caliper, depending on what you have. This is not going ahead. Okay. And the methods can be validated in different ways, but the most important is white to white. And here, if you have an op scan, even uh, the ICL people follow that. That's the star ICL. And of course, you have the IOL master, but be careful if there is a pterygium or a pigmented area on the cornea. There can be discrepancies in different devices. Now, UBM, you can see the sulcus is measured, and the op scan also gives you a white to white. So there are two different methods of checking the same thing out. And here you see a sh shallow vault. So you can see that the ICL is very, very close to the anterior surface of the lens. Now this, if it is less than uh, 0.125, it may lead to an anterior subcapsular opacification. So you may get dot cataracts. They normally don't progress. I've seen this in the past, and they remain at the place where there is contact. A large vault, you can see the old PI, because the old ICLs did not have 
a central hole nowadays you know that it is there but if it is a large more than one millimeter it may push the iris up it may cause peripheral anterior synecae and this may lead to glaucoma so this is one thing that is possible of course the icl you can see the distance between the posterior surface and the anterior surface so this is an ideal vault the ideal vault is 0.25 to 0.75 away from the anterior lens capsule so this is the right uh, wall that we want in every case as far as the icl goes so you can see the distance between the anterior lens capsule as well as the uh, icl so this is what we want to target for each and every patient and its summary is again that sizing sizing and sizing is the most important thing either an electronic caliper um, even getting it from the ubm and as well as getting it from the op scan Complications are, you know, that halos, glare, <coughs> pupil ovalization, iris um, retraction and atrophy. Rare complications are corneal decompensation, a Uwitz Zavalia syndrome, malignant glaucoma, end of an iphema. ICL, the problem is if first three days we have to give the patient oral uh, dimox because the patient's pressure goes up and that's mainly because of the methyl cellulose that may have remained. You all know that when we use viscoelastic, never ever use a heavy viscoelastic. I only like to use methyl, so do not use a helon or a viscoat or a helon GV or anything like that. We have to put below and you, when you finish putting the ICL, you have to make sure that with the Simco you go beneath the ICL and wash off all the methyl. The new ICLs have a central hole, so you do really don't need to do an iridectomy, what was necessary in the past. Uh, that is not really necessary. Some of them do develop uveitis uh, and uh, endothelial damage, surgical trauma, all this is routine in what can happen because of surgical problems. So if the diameter of the lens that is implanted horizontally, always remember that ICLs are implanted horizontally. They are never placed vertically because the calculation of your caliper is always horizontal. Another thing, if you want to put a toric ICL, the company will do the calculation and tell you to move, move the ICL uh, 10 o'clock position anti-clockwise or 10 o'clock position uh, clockwise. So that's all you have to do. And when you put the paper and check that you have to move it anti-clockwise or clockwise, you can use modern technology like uh, the Virion or the Callisto, and that itself can help you to rotate the ICL on the table if necessary. Otherwise, just do a marking and you can rotate the ICL as uh, necessary. So this is that is quite possible in today's world. Contraindication for ICL, you all know that if the anterior chamber is very, very shallow, it's not possible. Other contraindications like cataract, glaucoma, etc., is quite possible. Spontaneous rotation of ICL is known. Newer ICLs, as I mentioned, does have a central flow. Just to show you one video, this is an ICL, this is a toric ICL. Now, this patient's developed a cataract. I'll take a minute more. And when it comes to removal of the ICL, I'm going to show you this. Bring the ICL in the anterior chamber, rotate the ICL in the direction of your incision. And calculation as far as the IOL goes is very, very easy. With the ICL in position, really doesn't matter. Do your optical biometry, do your calculation, remove the ICL. You have your wound ready, just go ahead and do your fake emulsification and place the lens. So here you will see that I made the ICL horizontal. Go ahead and hold with the forceps. Now I'll just show you one step here that once I've held it with the forceps, I try to bring it out through a 3.2 and it slips once and it goes back, but it really doesn't matter. As you see that, it's slipped and it's gone back. Don't worry, go back in, hold it, and pull the whole ICL out. So it's as easy as that. This is quite easy. Uh, I'll show you one more method of removal of the ICL. Again, a small incision, a micro grasping forceps. Go ahead. Now, the Indian ICLs are much thicker. If you know that uh, the one made by Iocare is almost 250 microns, I'll take 30 seconds more. So it's not very easy to remove them. I cut this ICL in the anterior chamber and then just bring one half out and you've gone till the center. So you don't need to cut it through and through till the other end. Just go ahead, bring it through the center and then rotate it out. As you can see this, I'm rotating it out uh, and bring the whole ICL out. Then go ahead and do your FACO emulsification, do your rexis, do your FACO. There was a little bit of prolapse and that's done. Put the lens implant and that is done. So this is quite possible. In summary, for LASIK or laser, when it's not possible, borderline cases prefer to do surface. If that is not possible, go ahead and do ICL. That is how I advise my patients. And if nothing is possible, one option is, of course, there for a multifocal clear lens extraction. So LASIK or laser or ICL or clear lens extraction, surface treatment, if not possible, good anterior chamber depth ICL is advised. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, for giving a, a detailed talk in that eight minutes uh, which we are allowed. Uh, we go on to our next uh, speaker, our dynamic girl, Dr. Gaurav, who is going to tell you the controversial cases which come up in our practice and how we need to deal with them. We would keep the questions to the end, so please 
be seated right through and we are sure to create time and we are going to stick to our time of talk. Thank you. Thanks Dr. Chitra and uh, it's a privilege to be in your course. Uh, I will be showing a few cases and I'll trouble the panel also with few questions uh, in between so that we can have a better discussion. So refractive surgery is all about uh, good decision making and I think uh, doing the surgery itself is of course uh, necessary that you do a good job but knowing which procedure to choose when, when to say no when to say a conditional yes, how much to treat, how much residual stromal bed is safe. I mean, there are so many things which go into being a good refractive surgeon that it requires uh, years of uh, experience with refractive surgery to actually understand. And, you know, we are learning almost every day, even 15, 20 years after doing refractive surgery, I think I still continue to learn. So let's discuss a few cases. I thought it will be more interesting to do a you know case-based discussion. And uh, this gentleman, uh, 24 years old male uh, with a small correction, uh, minus one and a half with 0.5 at 20 degrees and 2.25 and 0.5 at 170 degrees improving to a crisp 6 by 6 and uh, wants refractive surgery. This is what the Pentacam maps look like. Now if you'll notice uh, there is a skew in the axes uh, which is a bit of a flag and if you'll see the elevation maps and the pachymetry is small it's about 460 and if you'll notice the other eye that's 464 similar skew. So Otherwise, uh, uh, straightforward refraction and uh, patient is keen to go with the surgery and this is the uh, enhanced ectasia display uh, which looks fairly good except that uh, the uh, percentage thickness increase is dipping as it is in the other eye. So uh, this is the other eye. So essentially we have to decide uh, whether we are going to offer him a refractive surgery at all. He's had a stable correction for almost three years and uh, has had no change in refraction and uh, is uh, having case of this degree. I think I'll start with uh, Dr. Ramamurthy. Would you offer him a refractive surgery at all? If he's, he's quite insistent that he wants something. I would go ahead and do uh, refractive surgery in him. 24 years, if no family history of keratectasia, mm -hmm. quite a stable power and a small power. I do a PRK and in, in case because I saw that the overall D in one of the eyes is yellow and also there's a mild skewing and the yes. uh, it's less than 470. So I do a PRK extra in him. Okay. An extra may not be necessary, but just as a matter of uh, additional uh, uh, safety. safety, I would like to do a PRK extra and I think he'll do well. Perfect. Uh, anybody else would differ? I mean, do something different? If you're doing the same thing, then let's go ahead. All of you want to do the same thing, is it? Shriganesh, you want to do something different? It'll be good to have his view. Let him tell. <laughs> 460, yeah, you. Huh? Because the yeah, 460. Refractive 455 and 1.5. Yeah, 1. 5. So you yeah. can do a smile extra because the residual. Vis a vis PRK, how would smile do better? Or if you're doing you know? a smile extra, then I think uh, both probably I feel would have the similar uh, result. Okay. But uh, the pain factor, because in a smile extra, you're not removing the epithelium. Right. You're injecting the dye in the interface and then… What thickness of cap would you use for this patient? 120. 120? 120. Okay. But so still you would have a residual bed of 300. Okay. Anybody would like to differ? I mean, Dr. Maipal, would you differ? He's busy. So anyway, let's… So I think I would have done a surface, but uh, Sri Ganesh is more confident about smile. I know that I he has much more experience than us. Question of whether about the biomechanical stability, which is better. Right. I think most of us still believe that uh, PRK is biomechanically a little more stable than SMILE. Because SMILE is possible, but uh, maybe smile that's the reason some of us would uh, offer this. Right, sir. All the same, you know, for the benefit of the audience, I would think that, yes, these are possibilities, but your first instinct should be to refuse this patient's surgery and, you know, keep him on follow-up. So the take-home message should not be that you jump and do a PRK or a SMILE on this patient. Personally, I would have, if patient was okay with it, I would have put him on follow-up for at least an year or two on pentacams, refractions, everything, corneal thickness, and mapped him for a couple of years and be sure that he's uh, got a stable cornea so on first instance probably might not treat it but I would be okay doing surface for this patient subsequently uh, just a question would anybody do smile on the uh, uh, ICL on this patient he has a very good uh, AC depth would anybody want to do smile uh, and I ICL I don't even know if they are available in this bar but there are some people who don't do LASIK at all and they do only fake lens so anybody who would do ICL no no okay so let's go to this uh, next case. I would also do a surface extra as, as you said. Now this is this girl 22 years old. 
now this was very peculiar just came to me about uh, two weeks back and uh, she had been worked up for lasik at another center and then one of my previous patients said that sir she is undergoing surgery tomorrow and i have motivated her to come to you so i said uh, you know why don't you go ahead she said no i mean uh, i want you to do it for her i said okay you bring her along they showed me all the uh, maps and scans and everything and they looked good so i called them over now this is what it looked like uh, she had uh, case which were in the 43s and 44s and a good corneal thickness 557 562 and uh, this is what the uh, anterior and posterior elevation maps and the four maps look like for the left eye for the right eye now she has a correction of minus 7 with 0.5 cylinder uh, would uh, dr chitra would you go ahead and operate this patient you should show the balance yeah that's where so where she was worked up there was uh, no provision for a Berlin Ambrosio map. So I had only these maps to go by. See, your AC depth is only 2.56. Yeah. So you can't do an ICL. Right. Okay. And what's her age? I missed out so she was, uh, let me check. Uh, she was 22. And she has a stable refraction for five years. That was the amazing yeah. thing. I wouldn't mind doing a smile for this uh, patient. But again, the Berlin, I would, I would have loved to see. Present day, we should look at the Berlin and take a call. Yeah, so we had these maps, but we didn't not have the Berlin Ambrosio when I saw these maps. Yeah. So we went ahead and you know worked her up, and uh, we did the Pentacam ourselves, and this is what came out. Now, if you look at uh, these maps, uh, you know you'll see this. Uh, you know, on the posterior maps, you'll see this. Uh, huh? Final overall D is uh, within normal limits. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, and this is the fellow eye. So, what we did was she was a contact lens user. She'd been off for almost 10 days. We asked her to stay off lenses and we repeated uh, the Pentacam after 10, uh, about a week of uh, a total of about uh, 20 days of contacts. But the maps did not change at all. So, for the time, okay, what would yes, you do? Uh, yeah. See, in patients with uh, a more prolate cornea, you mm. can see this. Mm. So, the corneas are normal, but slightly more They're prolate, still you can have. Uh, a little uh, increase in the anterior elevation and also a little in the posterior elevation, but it's still within, I mean, it's borderline. Yeah. And if you look at the final D, it's okay. So I think you should go more by the uh, curvature and the skew, uh, deviation, mm. infra superior steepening. Mm -hmm. These are mm -hmm. signs. Which all those things look all good, actually. Yeah, they are all so normal. So would you, you go ahead with a smile or, yes, yes. or would you so do so an extra smile? or No, just go just ahead with a smile. smile? Because, yeah, just mm -hmm. a smile. Okay. Because the thickness is good. Great. Let's quickly come on to one more uh, patient. And uh, this uh, girl, uh, minus 3 with a half cylinder and minus 3.25 with 0.75 cylinder. Stable refraction for 3 years, 27 years old. Now, she had come to us about 4 or 5 years back. And this is what the maps looked like uh, at that time. And uh, she underwent a surface ablation because uh, she was not fit for an ICL. Now these maps are not really good but this patient had to have a refractive surgery of some kind. She had been following up with us for two years and uh, she had had stable maps for almost two years. There was this inferior steepening and uh, frankly when we did this case about four or five years back we did not have the Billion Ambrosio display on our Pentacam. So we had uh, just to uh, go up with this and uh, she came for a follow up last week. That's how I pulled out her maps. So we had done a surface treatment with uh, a surface extra in 2014 January or something. Now this is what in retrospect we then look, took out her Pentacam data and this is what it looked like when we put it on the Berlin Ambrosio maps for the one eye and for the other eye. And uh, now with the post-op data is like, like this. She Today she looks like this. Uh, there's a surface uh, treatment which was done. This is the pachymetry map. And if you do a subtraction map, we have three datas on record. This was the pre-op with the inferior steepening. This was done about 2015, uh, one year later. And you can see the flattening continues to happen uh, even now in 2018. She's doing pretty well. Her uh, you know, refraction has remained very stable and she's about 0.25 uh, hyperope in one eye and in the other eye, this is the situation. And again, uh, a skew and uh, inferior steepening to some extent and continued flattening even after four years. So I think uh, surface extra works really well uh, as well as a good option for refractive surgery and gives very good stable uh, refractive results and this case I thought I, I will uh, share with you because it's in retrospect also uh, that uh, you know it had uh, uneasy maps and uh, so I think uh, if I've run out of time I'll stop here I had a few more c cases but I think we, we are yeah, out of time thing thanks just had an inferior steepening on the curvature map so probably we would have been we would have wanted to see the balance or a I know so the funny thing is contact lenses it could be I, a temporary I, I, thing. I know I think so you've been lucky doing so exactly so five years back we did not have Berlin Ambrosio I on know, our systems too. so this was only in retrospect 
retrospect that you know now we had the data yes, imported into safe. our new system and we decided to do a surface extra at that time and that has probably helped us uh, you know have a stable cornea and uh, not gone on to anything so i wanted to highlight that when in doubt on a suspicious cornea it's a good option to do us uh, you know uh, cross linking along with the surface treatments and that gives you uh, added uh, level of safety as well and even during retreatments doing a cross linking as dr gaurav said makes a lot of sense thanks a lot gaurav in the short while you put up some interesting cases we go on to dr mahipal sachdev i'm sure all of us know him very well more so in the last 6 months and uh, we are all supporting him so let's go ahead and uh, hear what interesting things he has to say about this uh, challenging uh, talk do we do prk or do we do smile which is truly better what well, do you dr mahipal thank you very much dr chitra for having me in the course uh, well these are two things which i'll say uh, making a comparison between the two may not be the best of situations that we are working on uh, both of them have their specific indications and uh, uh, today if i look at my practice just as a disclaimer uh, 90% of the procedures that i do are smile procedures uh, but there is definitely a space for prk and i'll just discuss as to where exactly what is the place and where we want which procedure to be done now when you are doing a, a a surface ablation uh, you essentially need uh, why is the video not working so you essentially need a raw surface which is uh, uh, which is when you have to remove the epithelium the epithelium can be removed either uh, from a perspective of by using a hockey stick or you can use the epithelium by uh using alcohol or by epilasic or you can remove it by uh, the laser per se uh, but one important thing that whenever we are doing a surface ablation except for very very small powers we always use mitomycin c and that has really changed the outcomes of surface ablation so this is you can apply on a pledget mitomycin c and depending upon the power that you are treating you would uh, extend the uh, number of uh, seconds that the mitomycin c is going to be working on now this is uh, the uh, we put a bandage contact lens in these cases and this is the second procedure that i have been asked to compare which is the smile procedure now you see when in a smile you are just using the femtosecond laser and this is the first pass that you pass for doing the undercut of the lenticule the thickness of the lenticule basically depends on the power that you are working on the second was a 360 degree cut and this is the cap and this is the side cut that has been created now once you have done this there needs to be a little expertise in your going on top of the lenticule and then creating the second channel which is at the bottom of the lenticule now using a blunt spatula you would wish to separate out the top part of the lenticule from the cap we don't call it a flap it is called as a cap that you have and once you have done that then you go to the under surface and you kind of continue with the uh, removal and the lenticule is taken out now let us look at the basic one conceptual difference between the two the main difference is that when you are looking at a prk what you are doing is that the nerves of the sub basal plexus and the anterior stroma are all burnt or they are ablated and they are left exposed at the base and the margin of the wound now what this causes is a lot of pain so this is the first thing as you all know uh, the uh, the laser vision correction started as prk and one of the biggest drawbacks was the pain and the recovery of vision so this still remains even though we are using nsa eye drops nowadays and we are putting a bandage contact lens but still there is a significant amount of pain that is there the second part which is there in the uh, prk is the haze which i will be discussing in due course of time now when you are looking at a smile you are leaving the epithelium as intact and since it is a very small incision it is only here that the corneal lobe bundles are severed and the patients are really not unhappy at all with the outcomes the discomfort score is very little for these patients now when you are looking at prk the epithelium obviously has to take some time to grow back and the epithelium typically takes between 2 to 5 days for it to grow back and during this period you have a raw surface and you all know that if there is a denudation of the epithelium that is the first nidus for developing an infection so infections are known to be slightly more with prk uh, than with smile the other thing is that the epithelial healing could be disturbed 
specifically in collagen disorders and there could be also a chance of a keloid formation which causes more of haze in these particular patients and till the epithelium has grown and regrown and grown and regrown the vision keeps on improving so there is a there isn't a spontaneity of the improvement of the vision because till you have had the whole thing become smooth the vision has not attained its uh, its full potential that is there in the prk now in this smile there is no excessive pain markedly reduced risk of corneal infection and a 3 mm incision versus a 3 to 20 degree uh, of a flap or when you are doing a prk total epithelium that has been removed that is the main difference that is there uh, in good hands of smile the vision spontaneity of recovery is as good as lasik so you actually get a 66 vision the next day that is there now the second thing which i was talking about is the haze which is there now when you are looking at the at the disorderly growth there is an apoptosis so when you have an apoptosis the anterior keratocytes uh, they there is an apoptosis they come they migrate towards the center the limbal stem cells activates and produce the post mitotic cells and what this depends on the amount of inflammation that is there and an individual variation the keratocytes become active and they the enzymes that are uh, that are released they cause the extracellular matrix the ecm uh, that is there the new extracellular matrix that is laid down after the prk you get this kind of a haze that is there now when you are looking at higher powers the quantum of haze generally tends to be more if you have had more inflammation the amount of haze tends to be more and if you have not used mitomycin c the amount of haze tends to be more and along with the treatment uh, the smaller zones that you work on when you are using broad beam etc they also caused most dis more disorderly growth and the haze was more apart from that when you are looking at hyperopic corrections the haze used to be more so these are the problems that you have today in my practice I do not treat any power above minus 6 diopters with a PRK. That is my upper limit that I do not go above 6 diopters for doing a PRK. And as I told you in smile, because the epithelium remains intact, the basement remains intact, you do not get that kind of disorderly growth which is there in a case of a PRK. So you don't get haze. Uh, there is on the contrary in a PRK because there is no surface below which so you don't get epithelial ingrowth because the epithelium is all gone new has to come the chances of DLK are much less and you can't get debris in the interface while in uh, smile you can have these epithelial ingrowth they are much less than LASIK but you can have debris etc which could be a problem uh, also you don't have regression the regression in smile is considered to be the least it is the most stable when you are looking at prk you get a higher amount of uh, regression which is there if you look at optical abrasions the smile is considered to be as good as uh, you have in prk which is there one final thing which is there when you look at uh, the uh, prk as regards biomechanical stability uh, lasik is considered to be inferior to smile smile has not been proven to be superior to prk general, general concept today that it could be as good uh, but the jury is still out uh, but there has been ectasia that has been reported more often in lasik less so in smile and the least in prk so that is what you have to do which you are looking at we have reported ectasia in cases and what we have to say finally i would wish to say is that smile today is just an aspheric tissue removal you cannot work on topo guided systems right when you are doing a prk for irregular corneas like you have post pk or you have optical you have an island that you need to treat etc you can work with a prk with a laser system which can it can correct these specific abnormalities on the cornea which you cannot do and these are couple of uh, uh, studies which have shown uh, topographic guided prk etc so that is one clear advantage that prk has over smile which is there post keratoplasty refractive errors etc so to sum up i would say post prk haze is a concern post prk pain is a concern high myopes should not be treated with prk Higher order abrasions are supposed to be slightly less in smile. Visual recovery is faster in smile. Visual stabilization is faster in smile. And for all patients where I have good corneal thickness, 
uh, which is above my cutoff. Like uh, Shri was saying, 460, 470, he would do a smile, but I still keep my cutoff as 490 microns, uh, or lowest I've gone is 480. So in any patient, up to the limit that we have for smile is minus 10 and minus six cylinders. So that is what you can correct in smile. So that is what we do. That is my gold standard, my standard procedure of choice. But PRK has its applications in certain situations that we wish to say. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Mahipal. That talk was uh, quite explanatory. I'll go on to give my presentation. A very good morning to friends on the dais and my dear friends in the audience. Uh, my due is to talk to you all about combining cross-linking with laser vision correction. I think by now all of us have come to understand that it makes sense to take on something good which we have learned about cross-linking in the past couple of decades and uh, applying it into a different area where it is going to definitely come in and give that extra strength further adds to this, uh, the strength of this talk and keeping the to my topic in mind these are the different combinations I would think of doing if I believe in a procedure and there are enough uh, uh, abstracts and papers and uh, trials which have been done it makes sense that we combine it for LASIK extra, PRK extra, SMILE extra or now even with keratoconus. So what is this corneal weakness? Corneal weakness could present as regression a could present as iatrogenic ectasia and we also know one solid truth that as you increase the flap thickness the biomechanical weakness of the cornea gets even more exaggerated. We've also come to understand that in a weaker cornea doing cross-linking makes sense because it restores the tenacity and the strength of the cornea and likewise it would make sense that it would address refractive regression and also lessen the risk of ectasia. The other concerns which would come forward is we do see the small haze which comes with cross-linking then then these are good normal eyes and when you club it with CXL you wonder whether it could have a refractive effect, it could have a haze and scatter. We also know that cross-linking could cause a prolonged flattening over the years and progressive hyperopia. So these might be our areas of stress. But again, if you go through all the articles and presentations over the last 10 years, you come to understand that the fluence which is being used is different, the duration of time which is being used is different, and keeping those factors in mind, although we are still looking at the tip of the iceberg as far as the knowledge of biomechanics is concerned, but definitely it makes sense to combine it, and it does not have any of the deleterious effects which you imagine it to have. So then... We look at younger eyes wherein the cornea could be elastic, high myopes and high probes where there could be regression, borderline topographies where we are neither here nor there, we'd rather be safe, family history of keratoconus, definitely for suspicious thin corneas when we are combining with pre-treatments. Probably the next question you'd ask when I finish my talk, doesn't it make sense to combine it in all patients? As far as the riboflavin, the vehicle is not dextrin here because it causes uh, flap shrinkage, dehydration, so that uh, would not be used. As far as a, a procedure, if you're doing it at flap, essentially you're going to go ahead and do your flap ablation treatment and then you're going to keep your flap folded up like a taco and then use 0.25% Vibex extra. You would keep applying it one drop every 10 seconds for 90 seconds, then wash the interface, put the flap back and then you would apply UV radiation at 30 milliwatts per centimeter square for 90 seconds. In other words, it would convert to 2.7 joules per centimeter square and if you stick to this format, it does well. Why would I avoid cross-linking the flap? We know that flap does not contribute in any way to the biomechanical strength. Rather, if you're going to apply riboflavin, it could cause flap shrinkage and because of it, microstray and a drop in BCBA. There have been innumerable papers and especially when I sat with this talk, I must have read any number of papers and each of us tells the analysis of results as this would say. This was a probably, I wouldn't go on to such a range of myopic correction which this doctor has done. But having said that, the results show that a LASIK extra fares far much better than LASIK in the, in the refractive regression. Again, if he has done, a stu this was studied by Don John Kenelopoulos on hyperopic patients. Herein again, you could see that there has been, the regression was lesser in the LASIK extra than in the LASIK alone patient. 
and this was at the third scenario where they have done a ch evaluated over a year's duration and again lasik extra seemed to fare better this was again a finite element model study wherein the impact of the intraocular pressure in a weakened cornea it was found that the uh, the, uh, the cornea which is cross linked displaces significantly less so in every way it makes sense so when now you understand that there is no refractive surprise no hyperopic shift no contra loss of contrast and no light scatter so then naturally it makes sense to look at prk extra whereas prk nowadays largely we do for uh, thinner corneas and if it is clubbed with a, a borderline topo or a retreatment it makes sense to do a cross linking here then when you're doing a prk would you combine it with uh, mmc when you know that cxl itself causes apto apoptosis of the keratocytes in the underlying stroma but then we need to understand that the migrating fibroblasts and the myofibroblasts which are going to come in from the limbus which contributes to the haze need to be taken care and mitomycin has to be used this is again a study of ours of 30 eyes wherein we found that doing a prk extra was safer and was as efficacious as the prk procedure so then what do we understand that the amount of epithelial thickening is related to the rate of the curvature change of the stroma so then in high hyperopes and myopes there is going to be a significant curvature change so then greater hyperplasia is expected we and also know that cross linking actually induces less hyper hyperplasia so it goes so clearly it postulates that do it would address refractive regression and definitely the likelihood and enhancements become less when you're treating a high hyperope and a myo again astigmatic corrections there is a change in the curvature and more uh, modeling is occurring so it expands the versatility of doing cross linking in these eyes so the logical conclusions is that in these situations because it addresses hyperplasia and remodeling it definitely accelerates refractive stability so then naturally it makes sense to go ahead and do it in a uh, smile extra and there have been again many studies which have shown the evidence of demarcation line and then so it expands its scope in doing these procedures rushing you to these cases a high myope as you can see with a corneal thickness around 480 all the parameters are well within normal range and when you do it with cross linking it definitely makes sense to see you feel far more safer and sure about your procedure again this is another eye a post lasik eye with this kind of uh, refractive result and the cornea was fairly stable uh, as you could see the belin doesn't make sense in a when you're doing a repeat uh, procedure but then when you have cross linked it with an enhancement it makes sense in smile extra you may wonder how you would do it essentially you would go ahead and remove the lenticule but after removing the lenticule you would use cross uh, riboflavin in the pocket and then wash it off after 90 seconds and then go ahead and do a cross linking over the surface of the cornea in a routine manner just a brief of combining it with refractive procedure in a keratoconus eye we all know that it makes sense not just to cross link we do something to improve the bcv of these eyes and if you could regularize these eyes uh, doing a refractive correction and then cross linking makes sense so basically by doing a regularization you're doing a central myopic treatment and a peripheral hyperopic treatment which creates a larger flatter cone and this makes the cornea stable and then you cross link it and lock it it's an absolutely safe cornea these are the clear indications only mild to moderate cases and only centered cones and only a tissue removal of 50 microns is indicated and there are innumerable studies which tell us go ahead go ahead so then we, why does it make sense to do them separately or on the same time yes simultaneous makes sense because it makes absolutely no sense to cross link and then do an ablation and remove the cross link tissue and again we are not aware uh, on a cross link uh, tissue how the laser ablation is going to perform because our nomograms are for virgin cornea so then it you make so you realize that you are able to look at cross linking with laser vision correction in even many more situations it was my last slide why did you switch it off? So, uh, taking you further, the stability of the cornea is uh, augured. So, I would like to conclude stating, I'm sure this talk would go on to half an hour and so are all the other topics. But it definitely, today when you get up from this audience and go, please keep in mind that cross-linking in laser vision correction has come to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chitra, for that uh, excellent coverage. Now we have uh, Dr. Shri Ganesh talking to us about fixing the cornea, topography guided treatments in virgin and post-classic eyes. Lasik per se causes so many problems 
and sometimes we need to deal with it and Sri Ganesh is going to take us through that. Good morning, dear friends, and I would like to thank Dr. Chitra for inviting me to this course. So we'll look at how topography-guided treatments can fix uh, abnormal eyes, uh, post-LASIK, or uh, it can be used even for treating uh, normal virgin uh, corneas. Dr. Chitra has already covered uh, its use in uh, keratoconus. I am a consultant for Carl Zeiss Meditech. So topo-guided treatments are basically based on the shape of the cornea and uh, the treatment is based on data which is obtained from a topographer. And the basic aim is to regularize the shape of the cornea. And the platforms available are the Alcon Allegretto EX500, the NIDEC uh, system with uh, CATZ, the MEL80 and MEL90 from Zeiss with the CRS master, that is a customized refractive surgery master the Schwind uh, ORK CAM, the Bosch and Lom Technolast. So these are all uh, systems which are capable of doing a topo link treatment. The data is basically obtained from a Placido device, which gives you more uh, of the curvature data. And Schlemflug devices uh, are used basically for screening. We all know that the uh, higher order abrasions are uh, denoted by uh, Zernike polynomials. And these are taken into consideration while designing the treatment. So if you look at the Zernike polyno uh, polynomials, the influence on visual acuity decreases with rising angular frequency. And at the same time, uh, a bigger radial order has a higher influence than a smaller one. So um, the bigger radial order actually in some systems can be eliminated to save uh, tissue, like in the Schwind uh, ORK cam. And uh, ideally, it is better to do an abrometry which uh, measures the deviation from the ideal wavefront. The ideal wavefront uh, error is zero. And this, you can have an idea as to uh, generally the uh, blurriness in the media. The corneal wavefront specifically measures the deviation from an ideal wavefront based on a model light, um, which is manufacturer dependent. Uh, the topography, uh, the Schlemflug, Topography basically is used for keratoconus screening. And uh, if there is any keratoconus, uh, then you may either postpone the treatment or do a cross-linking. Um, we'll not go into that as it's already covered. So how do you decide? Now you have various platforms. You have a wavefront optimized treatment. You have a topography link treatment. You have a, a ocular wavefront uh, guided treatment. So you have three options. So how do you decide? when to do which, um, there's a decision tree. Basically, you look at the cornea and ocular wavefronts. It's ideal to do both the cornea and ocular wavefront. And if you see that it is uh, less than uh, 25 diopters uh, equivalent, then you can go ahead with just a, um, a abrasion-free or uh, optimized treatment, which is an aspheric uh, treatment. If the cornea and ocular uh, Wavefront is uh, less than uh, 0.5 diopters, uh, and best corrected vision is better than 2020. Again, uh, if there are no complaints of night vision, then you can just go in for an optimized treatment. If there is uh, any complaints of uh, night vision, then again, you will have to look at the difference between the corneal and ocular wavefront. And if the corneal wavefront is more, then you go in for a corneal wavefront treatment. And um, if the ocular wavefront uh, um, uh, um, abrasions are more, then you can uh, look at the age and um, of the patient and any lenticular changes. If no age, uh, I mean, if younger age uh, group and no lenticular changes, then you can go in for an ocular wavefront. Otherwise, you will have to do a, uh, either a no treatment or you can go in for an IUL uh, for this patient because lenticular changes also can give rise to change in the ocular wavefront. So this is how you decide. If you look at the um, profiles, basically the difference between the abrasion-free treatment, the corneal wavefront treatment, and the ocular wavefront treatment is that in the abrasion-free treatment, uh, the higher order abrasions which are already there are uh, preserved, but you just have an aspheric ablation pro profile, and then you make a compensation uh, for uh, the abrasions induced by the flap and by the laser and the biomechanic, um, biomechanical effect. 
whereas the, in the corneal wavefront and the ocular wavefront, you correct the higher order abrasions. If you look at the Q value again in the abrasion free uh, treatment, uh, Q value is uh, dependent on the correction of the spherical equivalent. In a corneal wavefront, you can actually aim for a particular uh, Q value, for example, minus 0.25. And in an ocular wavefront, the change in of uh, Q value is dependent on the spherical equivalent and also the correction of the higher order abrasions, especially the Z4 and Z6, Z8. And uh, spherical abrasions, again, uh, existing spherical abrasions are preserved in an abrasion-free treatment, whereas a corneal wavefront treatment, um, basically you target uh, zero for the spherical abrasion Z4 and Z6 um, with a model with a Q value of around, attaining a Q value of around minus 0.25 and whereas ocular wavefront treatment, basically the overall the ocular um, wavefront is targeted at uh, zero. And then in a higher order abrasions, again with uh, abrasion free treatment, you preserve all the existing uh, higher order abrasions, you only optimize the treatment for correction of uh, the asphericity and the um, biomechanics and the flap induced uh, and laser induced abrasions, whereas a corneal wavefront you target all coefficients abrasions close to zero for a given model I based on a Q value. And ocular wavefront again you target zero for all the higher order abrasions. So th this is the difference between the uh, three. This we already spoke about. So if you look at the literature uh, uh, the literature is quite uh, conducive for uh, topo-guided customized treatment um, and uh, especially it has a lot of therapeutic uh, benefits for uh, uh, treatment of irregular corneas, even ectatic corneas now. And uh, recently topo-guided treatments are being used even on normal corneas. So if you look at the uh, literature here, this was a um, publication from uh, PGI Chandigarh. Um, which said that uh, topo-guided treatment provided better contrast sensitivity, lower induction of higher order abrasions and smaller amount of tissue ablation even on virgin corneas. Another publication uh, using the NIDEC uh, says that it gave better night vision compared to conventional LASIK. So topo-guided treatments are being used even for virgin eyes and you have the contour now from Alcon. Uh, just one example of uh, this was a case which who had already undergone LASIK, uh, male 24 years ago, uh, came after three months with uh, blurring of vision, his best corrected vision, he had a sphero uh, mixed astigmatism and uh, best corrected vision was 612 in the right eye, left eye the best corrected vision, uh, he had a, a cylinder with improving to 6-9 parts. And this is his uh, topography, you can see that there is some amount of irregularity on the pentacam and then uh, uh, after the treatment, you can see this is the difference, but uh, if you look at the atlas, we use the atlas for the treatment, which is a placido-based uh, system, and you can see this pre-op, it is quite irregular, and then post-op, uh, it's much more regular. And we did just a topo smoothening, which is basically treating the irregularity of the cornea without any correction of the refractive error. And this is the left eye, you can see post-op, it's much better. And this is the CRS master which gives you the ablation pattern in the right eye and left eye. You can see that the ablation is quite irregular. This is basically to take care of the irregularity in the cornea. And post-op this patient had a residual refractive error minus 0.25 with minus 1 improving to 6.6 in the right eye. Left eye he had a small cylinder improving to 6 by 7.5 and the maximum allowed uh, for a topo smooth is 50 microns. And it is not a good idea to combine the refractive correction along with the topo smooth because you just want to improve the best corrected vision and the quality of uh, vision and night vision. So these are a few of the take home points. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sri Ganesh. That was a good talk. We now go on to uh, another very interesting topic, uh, second chance arresting and treating myopic regression and that is something we sometimes you just cannot understand that you've had a good cornea, good thickness to start with, you're so sure you'd get away with it and let's hear what Dr. Ma, uh, Ramurthy has to tell us about it. Uh, good morning friends. Uh, I think the first thing I would like to emphasize that whenever you're taking up a treatment for a patient for retreatment, you have to exercise caution. 
do not treat if the patient is happy. There are multiple occasions when the patient comes with no complaints, but my optometrist writes down on the charts that he or she has a 0.75 residual. Maybe approaching presbyopic age group, uh, that might be actually good for them. So do not create a problem when none exists. And if you have a, a satisfied patient, best is to leave him or her alone. And again, whenever you're treated uh, um, uh, facing a patient with residual refractive error, you have to understand that uh, iatrogenic characteristics is first manifests as uh, a, um, a recurrence of power. Again, if there's early cataract which can occur in high myopic individuals, there could be lenticular uh, myopia, which obviously should not be treated on the cornea. Retinal diseases, onset of presbyopia, etc., could co cause a drop in visual acuity, and that should not be attributed to power. Again, before taking up a patient for retreatment, you have to ensure that the best corrective visual acuity is near normal, or at least what was there in the preoperative level, so that you know that it's the power which is at fault, and you need to address that. So, what are the prerequisites for me to take up a patient for retreatment? Usually, I wait for at least a period of six months because it could be either regression or a residual power. We need stable refraction, stable topography at an interval of at least three, three months done twice over. And then examine previous refractive surgical details, especially if it has been done elsewhere. And again, I would like to leave behind, take up corneas only which have a pachymetry of more than 450 microns and stick to the golden A rule that uh, leave behind a residual stomal bed of at least 300 microns. These are uh, uh, diseases that I treat very aggressively, dry eye, myobomian gland disease. Optimizing the ocular surface is most important. Sometimes it might be a very unhappy patient with a residual error of 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopters. But once you optimize the ocular surface, the patient might be quite comfortable. Might, uh, but the, uh, it may not be the power which is causing the problem, but uh, inappropriate ocular surface. And that needs to be optimized before you take up these patients for a retreatment. What are the two major choices allowed, uh, available for us? Recutting a new flap is something that I did new, 20 years back. And at that time, it used to leave behind small silvers of tissue that could cause irregular astigmatism. So that's not an option. Relift the original flap or surface ablation on the flap are the two things that I'm going to talk about. Relifting the flap, I used to pride myself with the fact we started doing LASIK way back in 1997, that even after 12, 15 years, I can lift back flaps. As you can see, this, this is something which is uh, I'm lifting over after 12 years and then going ahead with the laser vision correction for the residual power and putting the flap back. It's hardly a 30-second procedure. And one thing you need to notice and understand is that whenever you're dealing with a femtosecond flap, it's a little more difficult to lift. These are two eyes, uh, one with the, treated with microkeratome eight years back, femtolastic just nine months back. It's not that the other one is being played slow. It's actually the difficulty I face while relifting this flap. And it's doable. In every femtosecond flap can also be lifted up. But then the edges heal up better, the interface heals up better, which in a way is a good thing. That's exactly what we want. And they, we don't want these flaps to be displaced too quickly. So why is it that we have another option? It's simply because you have the chance of epithelial ingrowth whenever that can happen after primary elastic also, but the chances significantly increases whenever you do a relift. These are epithelial ingrowth in our cases have been quite few and far, but then these are some of our own cases. And whenever it encroaches on the visual axis as causes uh, irregular astigmatism that needs to be addressed. And one of the major causes for epithelial ingrowth, the incidence is very highly variable. It has been reported anything between 2 to 43 percent. Late, the later the flap lift is done, untidy epithelial edges, excessive maneuvering, older the age group of the patient, if the primary treatment has been done for hypropic corrections, and if there are epithelial abnormalities, these are the instances when epithelial ingrowth chances are higher. Most importantly, relevant to this talk is this study, and this has also been substantiated by other studies where it shows that within three years of primary LASIK, if you lift up the flap, then this, there is about 1% chance of epithelial ingrowth. But if you do it after three, time, three years, it increases by almost seven times. It is an empirical number. Other studies may not have the, exactly the same statistics. But suffice it to say that the later you lift up the flap, more are the chances of this epithelial ingrowth. But of course, the good thing is that even if epithelial ingrowth occurs, we can always deal with it using mitomycin C and relifting it. 
And what about this other option that I was talking about, that's PRK over flap, it's uh, fairly simple. What we do, whether it's a flap or a cap, we do the same thing even after a smile procedure, we do nearly the same thing. In the sense that we do a, um, a surface procedure, a PTK procedure, remove about 50 microns of tissue, then whatever small islands are there, we uh, wipe them away. And usually what you get, you do see a lot of striations on the residual bed, but that need not bother you. Uh, go ahead and treat the residual power, which is usually small. Use mitomycin C. In these cases, I use 0.02% for a period of one minute and subsequently pay, place a contact lens. And of course, uh, the discomfort is there, but now if you handle these patients optimally, I find that this is really not a problem. So what exactly are the disadvantages, as I just mentioned? Obviously, pain and discomfort for a couple of days, but then the safety that accrues with it is something that I would not compromise on. Slower visual uh, recovery, haze, which might be occurring but may not be a problem since we usually treat very small powers. But in case you go through the thickness of the flap or the cap and start treating the bed, the chance of the haze becomes significantly more. So you should be cognizant of that and make sure that you try to confine your treatment within the uh, flap and avoid in going through the flap and prolong medication. Usually we put these surface ablation treatment patients, whether it's primary treatment, secondary treatments for all low dose steroids, low tiprednol for almost four months. And uh, smile is something that many of us are doing in significant numbers. This is one option that is available to us. Where it's a circle software, what we do is to extend the uh, cap that has been created peripherally and the edges of the cap and then you uh, have a, um, way to approach the uh, depth of the underneath the cap and convert that into a flap. Basically, you lose the advantages of uh, doing a, a smile, a flapless procedure, but then this works well. We have done a two or three cases, but in our own experience, we find that doing a PRK procedure is equally effective, and because of the cost involved, we more often stick to that. And when, as has been alluded to by other speakers, whenever you are faced with an uh, abnormal cornea, it's always a good idea to do the treatment as a topo-guided treatment on the surface of the cornea. Obviously, if you do it under a flap and then expect it to go ahead and manifest on the surface, that's something that not, does not always work. So uh, as far as the treatment profile itself is concerned, if it's only pure refractive error, I go ahead with wavefront optimized. If large amounts of coma and trifoil is there, it's wavefront guided. If it's essentially irregular cornea, it's topo-guided treatment that we do. And if whenever it's wavefront guided or topo-guided, it's PRK, which is preferable. So in summary, there are two options that are available to us when it comes to enhancement. One is flap lift, another is laser on the bed. If it's essentially under treatment, I'm treating the patient within a year or two, I'd go ahead and lift up the flap and treat because that's somewhat uh, more easier on the patient. But whenever it's beyond two to three years, doing it on the surface of the cap or the flap is a good idea. And uh, um, that's, that makes the treatment so much safer, reduces or, or, or makes the chance of epithelial growth almost nil. The last slide of mine, I was also asked to correct, what would you do to uh, treat regression, myopic regression? This is one study. There are just a couple of other studies which show that when you put these patients about 0.5% timolol on a prolonged period of time, even after it's discontinued after six months, the regression get, tends to get arrested. Of course, this has to be borne out, but since it has little side effect, whenever you are faced with a problem of regression, you might try this out before resorting to retreatment. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramurthy, for giving us a very detailed talk on this very interesting topic. We go on to the last but not the least. We all need to know how do we manage an iatrogenic ectasia if you are landed up with similar, such a problem. And we have Dr. Shesh Ramurthy who is going to tell us the different refractive modalities of correcting this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, one and all. So iatrogenic ectasia is uh, definitely a complication which none of us want to have. But if we are faced with such a situation, and most of us who've been practicing refractive surgery do face it uh, on occasions, it's really important to know how we can manage these cases so that we uh, keep these patients who've had such a disaster happy and satisfied at the end of the day. So the key to iatrogenic ectasia is early detection. And very often, a, a subtle form of regression or a decentered ablation can actually appear like an early ectasia. Take, for example, this particular patient. Uh, if you see in the anterior curvature map, you can actually see that there is a certain amount of inferior steepening. 
but this is actually just a decentered ablation it is more superiorly decentered the key here is to see if the re reduction in pachymetry is proportionate to the amount that you have ablated and most importantly look at the posterior float the anterior float curvature pachymetry all are uh, affected by your laser directly but with a Scheinflug device the posterior float is not affected the reason why I said Scheinflug device is because let me show you another, another example which is a very old scan that's why it looks it's looking so fuzzy it is again just a decentered ablation but if you look at it on the posterior float there is really an elevation it's important for us to know that earlier uh, most of the authors thought that every case of LASIK has a forward protrusion in the post-operative period but this was found later after the advent of good imaging through Scheinflug devices that this was just an artifact so if you have an old scan uh, 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 older uh, a patient who has undergone LASIK a few years back and you look at this early post-operative scan and look at this red spot it's easy to misconstrue this as early ectasia now moving on to the management proper we have a variety of options spectacles contact lenses CXL topo guided lasers intacts toric ICL and last but not the least dark so how do we use them where do we how do we go about applying these various forms of uh, treatment that we have available with us and appropriate case selection so let me go over it with uh, a simple algorithm so if you have a patient with post LASIK ectasia and uh, you see first try fitting the patient with a contact lens and if they are tolerant to a contact lens it's probably best left that way with the advent of these Roske and miniscule lenses it's almost possible to fit any patient of uh, ectasia or keratoconus with the contact lens and they believe me they have the best quality of vision with contact lenses in case they are not contact lens tolerant then the next question we should ask ourselves is the visual axis clear if the visual axis is clear then we can think of cross-linking them when the ectasia is progressive now when it comes to post LASIK ectasia there is this other question do we really wait for progression like we do in keratoconus the thing which is established in post LASIK ectasia in uh, published literature already is that unlike keratoconus even at a later age post LASIK ectasia tends to progress so probably it's best to cross-link these patients even at the at the time you diagnose them with post LASIK ectasia is cross-linking of a lesser efficacy in post LASIK ectasia than keratoconus possible the reason being that while cross-linking the anterior 120 or 140 microns of your cross-linking is probably restricted within the flap itself which is really not contributing to the biomechanical efficacy of your cross-linking procedure so it's only the residual bed the amount of cross-linking which goes into the residual bed which is really going to be key in preventing progression in hydrogenic ectasia so it's a small caveat to be kept in mind recently we have had a lot of advances in cross-linking itself where uh, studies have shown that both post LASIK ectasia and keratoconus start off as a localized disease and it is probably best to cross-link them to have better refractive results by cross-linking over the area of weakness in the focal areas where you are the ectasia has just begun so with the advent of the uh, avidro mosaic which we have available with us we are able to customize the cross-linking pattern to the kind of ectasia which the patient uh, has developed so you can have concentric zones of, uh, of uh, cross-linking done where you deliver the greatest energy over the weakest area of the uh, at the apex of the cone or the, at the apex of the keratoconic or the ectatic cone so thereby the maximum amount of flattening also happens at the apex giving rise to better refractive outcomes you can also have other customized patterns and these kind of patterns tend to address the astigmatism a little bit more it's uh, very often in post LASIK ectasia you have especially in early ectasia you have a greater IS asymmetry and this kind of a more inferiorly uh, decentered sector kind of cross-linking really helps in not only strengthening the cornea but also in addressing the astigmatism as just the pupillary tracking which is also built into the device really ensures that the centration is maintained throughout the cross-linking procedure now once you've cross-linked the patient the next question is how do you rehabilitate them in terms of vision so then comes the question is it a centered cone or an eccentric cone so when you have a centered cone you could try a topo guided PRK with the cross-linking now Dr. Sri Ganesh already elaborated on how you do a topo guided PRK but in these cases of uh, post LASIK ectasia we have to remember that this is a patient who already has a thin cornea 
and very rarely will you get a patient of post lasik ectasia who is suitable for topo guided prk we have to ensure that they have a minimal thickness of 450 the maximum ablation should not uh, be more than 50 microns it might appear counterintuitive to say that you know already it's the ablation which has caused the ectasia so can you actually go ahead and do a little bit more ablation with the cross linking we must remember that again in the post lasik ectasia there is a flap which is about 100 120 micron thick at least and you are going to be ablating only the flap when you are doing a topo guided regularization which in itself is not contributing too much to post lasik ectasia and studies have shown that after topo guided cross linking with cxl that even post lasik ectasia is exceedingly stable with good visual results this is one example of such a case where we have done topo guided prk and uh, cross linking in an early post lasik ectasia with sufficient thickness and the patient had a very satisfactory refractive outcome both not just in terms of topography but as well as in the uh, best corrected visual acuity the next question is how do we remove the epithelium the reason why this question has come about is because in these ectatic corneas especially in post lasik ectasia the epithelium is the devil it really there is a lot of uh modification which happens the uh, just to show you a quick example of a patient this is not an ectatic cornea but just a patient who has regression you can see that there is almost a 13 micron increase in uh, the epithelial central epithelial thickness itself and that itself can contribute to about a diopter of refraction so when you are mapping the cornea based on the anterior curvature it is important that the treatment is also maintained once you have removed the epithelium so using a ptk mode uh, instead of manual debridement of epithelium will to a certain extent ensure that the same contour which you mapped in the preoperative period is uh, continues to be there when you're doing the ablation as well i'll quickly move on to the uh, rest of the this thing where in now if you have an eccentric cone what is your choice so intax is probably or any intracorneal uh, ring segment is probably one of the best treatment modalities for post lasik ectasia because usually their thickness does not permit any other procedure or any other ablative procedure to be performed and usually in post lasik ectasia unlike in keratoconus the keratometry which was already flat to begin with is restricted between 46 to 60 diopters and they are very suitable candidates for intracorneal ring segments we have to look at the preoperative spherical equivalent location of cone and the amount of asymmetric astigmatism again in post lasik ectasia i'll just finish in one minute uh, post lasik ectasia where uh, there is a greater amount of is asymmetry as compared to keratoconus which tends to be more central in the earlier stage so first we look at the location of the cone to see if 50% of the cone is within the center or decentered based on which we either use symmetric rings or asymmetric rings now the other thing we have to remember in early ectasia because you can't do topo guided when the cornea is thin we also have thinner segments now the uh, thinner as well as shorter arc segments so we should remember that when the arc segments goes on increasing from 60 degree to about 90 degree they have a more focal effect and the focal effect is more effective in correcting astigmatism beyond 90 degree as we go on to 120 130 150 segments and beyond they have a more global effect and bring about a greater reduction in the spherical equivalent so just a quick example of a patient where you can have purely astigmatism or a small amount of hyperopia with astigmatism these patients will do very well with the shorter arc 90 degree segments than the conventional 150 degree arc segments that we use in other patients so is a example of a patient who uh, you can see an excellent uh, uh, topographic uh, regularization as well as an improvement in the refraction and uncorrected and best corrected post intax the rehabilitation however continues to remain challenging contact lens fitting is not very easy because you have a flatter center and a steeper mid periphery so what else can you do now if you have a low residual error following the intax with sufficient thickness which is rare in post lasik ectasia you could do a topo guided prk but however we must watch out that the incidence and the propensity for haze in these patients tends to be much higher than in your regular patients so beware when you're doing a topo guided prk post intax in a post lasik ectasia however toric fakic iol whether it's a centered cone post cxl or a high residual error post intax once you have centered the cone a toric fakic iol works extremely well so in well centered ectasia and uh, or if you have had a decentered ectasia which you have centered using the intax 
importantly look at the best spectacle corrected visual acuity with contact lenses all patients may have an excellent bcva but only if they have a good spectacle corrected visual acuity with a uh, with a significant amount of residual uh, sphero cylinder they they are the patients who are likely to do with uh, uh, do very well with the toric fakey coil ideal time interval a 6 months duration would work extremely well going back to the last frontier if the visual axis is not clear then probably the only option you are left with is either doing a dalk or a pk the videos yeah so in patients either whether you are able to achieve a big bubble or not whether you do a manual dissection it really works very well in these patients both with keratoconus as well as post lasik ectasia and the story doesn't end there after suture removal you can still subject these patients to topo guided prks to contact lenses and ensure that they have excellent uh, best uh, both uncorrected and best corrected visual acuities so we have a wide range of treatment options available and which is uh, judicious uh, decision making and combination therapy we can ensure that we can have optimal outcomes even in such disastrous scenarios thank you so much for your attention thank you dr shesh i think shesh and rather all of us today understand that refractive surgery even are following an iatrogenic ectasia can be given back the best corrected visual acuity which they deserve so we have just about 5 minutes left are there any questions in the audience you want to ask we can definitely um, help you out any queries which came up yes dr praveen switch on the mic hello yes yeah. yes in smile extra you are using riboflavin in the interface yes uh, do you notice any endothelial changes in specular microscopy in this case no no no, no because no, you are uh, using the endo uh, riboflavin at 300 bed so riboflavin is not causing the problem if at all you expect uh, no. an endothelial change is the uv light yeah. that is why riboflavin is actually used as a shielder uh, okay. so by placing it at a little lower level it should not be causing any, any problem end. okay and okay. you wash it away pretty fast yeah. the so it's only the, for 90 seconds yeah the 90 only seconds. thing that you have to remember is don't use dextran because that causes dlk so you have to use riboflavin in saline okay uh, there was a question here yeah uh, just one more question to shreyas yeah. yeah, shreyas uh, in iatrogenic ectasia how do you come up to the mic how do you establish uh, a case of iatrogenic ectasia and whether you do a routinely post op corneal topography in these cases yes recommend that we do a uh, topography anywhere between 3 to 6 months when the topography has stabilized we uh, do a scan as a baseline and at that time the curvature pachymetry serves as a baseline for any future comparisons so suddenly even if uh, you know you feel that the pachymetry has decreased it really helps to compare with the previous uh, shine flag image i think the best indicator is a patient coming back to you with sudden decrease of vision No, the, 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 patient, the patient will immediately heal. The patient will say that he or she had good vision, and then all of a sudden, after some time, the patient feels that the vision is going down. So at that particular time, always, always do a topography. That's most important because often you don't have patients following up. The issue is Just to I differentiate to between regression, regression and ectasia. Regression and ectasia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we, but then we, the we moment you do a K, and if your keratometry is coming higher, that's the time that you immediately think that there's something wrong. and posterior Actually, float in uh, we make it a routine to do a 3 months post operative uh, um, topography in all these patients and give the report to them so that is the time period with which you compare in the post op couple of years later if the patient lands up you know what was the status at around 3 to 4 months after the primary treatment and keep it as the baseline and look at progression that gives us a good idea last question my question is why all are not considering corneal biomechanics in uh, lasik workup Of It course, corneal biomechanics is a very essential component in LASIK workup. Yeah. We have an ocular response analyzer. We have a Corvus. We do it for every single patient. We do look at the topo tomographic biomechanical index, and if there is a suspicion, actually, I have a talk on Corvus in the diagnostics in refractive surgery. I do look forward to seeing you all. It te it tells us, gives us a hint, and then we, of course, we need to correlate all the factors. and then go ahead and combine with cross linking or say no to these patients biomechanics although our knowledge is not very significant still although we have these two exotic machines with us but definitely it clues us it gives us a thought process in a, a direction and then it sort of makes us cautious in dealing these patients yeah
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my dear audience. So, uh, I hope this course was uh, informative enough. Thank you.